Hey, good morning, Doxology. How are we doing? It's good to see you this morning. I hope that you had a happy Thanksgiving and uh, that it was a sweet uh, week for you this past week. I, I do understand that for some, uh, Thanksgiving can be a hard week as you look around the table and you see people um, or see spots where there were people last year and they weren't this year. I understand that for some, it's a hard week. Uh, because you go back and you're interacting with family and uh, there's been conflict and it's just difficult. And I, my prayer would be that for you in those moments that you would experience God's presence, God's comfort, and know that he's a God who's with you in the midst of that. And I don't know what your Thanksgiving routine looks like, at least for us. We um, gather with family and oftentimes what happens is we spend a lot of time cooking, uh, then we spend a lot of time eating and then kind of eating again. And kind of in between those, there's uh, gatherings with kids where we're wrestling or playing football or trying to break up fights or all kinds of other things like that. Um, but that's kind of the way it looks in our house. And then sometime later in the evening, uh, the kids have kind of gone to bed and um, my wife and I uh, sit down on the couch and we are tired and, and my grandparents are there or my dad's there. And uh, we kind of all open up a laptop or a phone and we look at Facebook. Like that's just family <laughs> gatherings now, right? Um, and, or we look at Instagram. And one of the things I've loved is being able to look at people's family pictures. Be able to see uh, who it is they're gathering with and uh, be able to kind of make those connections. And it kind of got me thinking, um, do you know how many photos are shared on Instagram every day? 27 million is way too low. It's 95 million photos a day are shared on Instagram. You wonder where our time is going, <laughs> right? 95 million photos a day are shared on Instagram. And it begs the question, like, what is it that we love so much about Instagram? What is it that we love so much about Apps like that that allow us to share photos. Well, one of the things that we have to enjoy so much about them are the filters, right? That we will use filters on these photos to change the lighting, to, to, to make sure that we are um, uh, seeing something uh, that maybe it wasn't real. Uh, we change uh, not only the lighting, we change the colors in it, right? We'll go with something that looks old. We'll go with something that looks new, um, We'll make sure that what we're doing is we're identifying an object specifically and kind of making the rest of it look hazy behind there. Uh, more recently, what we've done with filters is it changes the way in which we view people, right? Uh, my my six-year-old son loves this, that you can use uh, some of those apps to make his face look like an elephant or a puppy dog, right? <laughs> we do these things. Um, and... Uh, just so you have an example, I think we have a few examples to share with, with all of us today of some of these. And so uh, for those of you who are a Star Wars fan, you have Yoda who's like 800 years old on the left and he gets tired of wrinkles. And so he uses the filter and on the right, that's what we have. Um, our staff kind of had some fun with this. And so we've got a few from our staff page to share. So Cameron on the left, Sanderson, right? We all know his beard. It's a glorious beard. On the right, this is old Cameron, right? Uh, here's one more I think we've got for us today. There we go. Yeah, look at that. That is a Chris Freeland Trace filter that we've used on the right, and I will never unsee that again. That's bad. But the reality is this technology is not new, that for all of us, we have used filters to shape the way in which we view reality and the people that we interact with it for years and years and years. Maybe there are filters that you recognize in your own heart for how you view people. Filters don't just impact the way in which we see uh, the world. They impact the way in which we live in it as well. See, the way that we treat other people flows from the way in which we perceive them. And so if we perceive other people as enemies or foes, it's going to lead to criticism or disputes. Think about our political discourse right now. And the ways in which different sides are looking at each other as the problem in our country right now. That's flowing from this filter of seeing people as your enemy. If we perceive people as interruptions or annoyances, 
That's going to lead to impatience. It's going to lead to avoiding them. Think about the way in which in this season, for students, as you're finishing up your semester, how there can be so much on your plate that you want to avoid other people. In this season, in the Christmas season, when there's so much for us to do to get ready for it, the way in which we'll try to avoid other people because what that means is they're going to spend our time and we've got so much on the to-do list, we don't have time for them. That's a filter problem. If we perceive other people as hopeless, that's going to lead to a hardening heart that lacks empathy and compassion for them and the needs that they have right now. Can you think of people like that? Think about the lady that asks for money every time I take my kid to soccer practice. She sits at the same intersection. How often have I viewed her through a filter of hopelessness? that lacks that empathy and compassion that she deserves. These filters and others are what so many of us experience, and let's be honest, practice on a regular basis. And in some ways, the pandemic has caused these filters to be so much more permanent in our minds. Think about the way in which uh, we see other people treat retail workers and food service employees. There's a, a study done here several months ago, it was a poll taken with retail workers, and they said that 97% of them said there's been a rise in verbal harassment from customers since March of 2020. And nearly 40% of those who were asked said they would leave their job if they could afford to do so. Have you seen that? I know I've seen that. As someone dresses down a waiter for putting bacon bits on their salad. How often have we been guilty of that? Think in other places. Think about our roads and how oftentimes what we see is aggressive driving. Uh, just a few months ago, Dallas PD talked about the rise and the increase in aggressive driving there in Dallas. You ever been tailgated? Ever had somebody speed past you and just kind of stare at you? Have you ever been guilty of those things? <laughs> no perfect people allowed, right? Where, where do those come from? Those come from these filters that we use that aren't just the way in which we perceive other people, but also affect the ways in which we treat them. And I think for all of us, Scripture reminds us that that's not the way that God sees those individuals or treats them either. See, going all the way back to Genesis 1, what we see is that God created all things, speaking them into existence, and yet the pinnacle of all that he made was not that, that beautiful mountain experience that you've had before. It was not the sunset on a beach that was the pinnacle of God's creation. It was not the starry night sky when you're sitting in the middle of the country and those stars are shining so brightly. That's not the pinnacle of God's creation. The pinnacle of God's creation are the ordinary people that you and I interact with on a daily basis. Psalm 8 reminds us that they are crowned with glory and with honor. You ever thought about that? You ever thought about the, the person who's checking you out at Walmart is crowned with glory? Well, actually, Walmart doesn't do um, people checking out. It's all self-checkout now. It's Albertsons. You ever thought about that person is crowned with glory and with honor before God? You ever thought about students, that, that, that individual who sits alone either at lunch or in your room, that they are crowned with glory and with honor? That person who's driving slow in the left-hand lane, crowned with glory and honor. That every single person that we interact with on a daily basis is crowned with glory and honor and deserves respect and dignity and compassion as an image bearer of God. What we see in Scripture as Jesus appears on the scene is that he not only is Savior and Lord, but he invites us to a different way to live. It's every individual that he interacts with. He's coming and he's sharing those things with them, and he's calling on his people to do the exact same thing. 
What would it look like for you and I to be people this Christmas season who treat others the way that the Lord has treated us and the way that he's called us to treat them? What would it look like for us to forsake those filters and instead to see them as God sees them? Well, in some ways, I think that's what we see in Mark chapter 5. So if you have a Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 5. Mark is uh, kind of, if you're an action movie kind of person, Mark is the gospel for you. He does not spend much time looking at the teachings of Jesus. Instead, what he is all about is looking at the actions and the interactions that Jesus has with other people. And part of the reason for that is that when Jesus appears on the scene, Jesus is coming into a world where there is political decay, there's religious hypocrisy, there's this social unrest that's at a boiling point. So nothing that we can identify with, right? And in that darkness, Jesus comes on the scene as a light that shines bright with every individual he interacts with. He offers some hope and light that causes the darkness in their life to flee. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to begin reading in Mark 5 verse 21. But what we see is Jesus interacts with three people that as, as we look at them, we may be tempted to view through a filter that would cause us to treat them less than as image bearers of God. And Jesus avoids that, and he invites his people to do the exact same. So let's begin reading in verse 21. It says this, When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him. And while he was by the lake, then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and when he saw Jesus, he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him, My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. See, the first person we meet in this encounter uh, with Jesus is Jairus. He was a synagogue leader or official. That means he was a ruler. And in that culture, he had elite status. He was in line with the Pharisees, the religious leaders that constantly antagonized Jesus. So Jairus represents the filter of teams or tribes. Teams or tribes. Think for a moment how easy it is for us to view other people through this filter. Uh, Just this past week, if you watched any football, um, one of the things that you saw if you were watching college football, they call this rivalry week, right? And what they do is they show all these highlights of these schools that have played against each other for years and years and years and who do not like each other. It's us versus them. We wear the white hat, they wear the black hat. We don't like them at all. What are they doing? They're pitting these two together. We train young people to do this. In some ways, we train old people to do this too, right? Because we don't let go of that. What are we doing? We are using a filter that is seeing other people as the enemy, as a foe, as a different team or tribe than us. We don't want anything to do with them. As we get older, we begin to do that not only with a school that we would identify with. We begin to do that uh, with our politics. They're a Republican. They're a liberal. We do that with our media. They read the New York Times. Why would they do that? They watch Fox News. I don't know why they would watch that. Again and again, we begin to see other people and try to place them in these teams or tribes. We filter them out that way. See, anytime we find our identity in a group and ostracize everyone else, we're using this filter of teams or tribes. I don't know about you. Have you ever been introduced to a a, a third party and they said, oh, well, yes, so-and-so, he lives in Dallas. I don't live in Dallas. I live in Fort Worth. And I will correct people, and apparently with disdain, if if they introduce me as someone from Dallas. Why? Because that's a different team. That's a different tribe than someone else. Isn't that what happens so often in our culture? As sides have become more negative in their view of each other. Jesus shows us a better way that removes the filters and allows us to see other people as God's image bearers. That's what we see here. See, instead, uh, Jesus treats Jairus with respect and with compassion. He recognized the great need that Jairus had in this moment and the desperation that Jairus had. As he comes and he falls at Jesus' feet, and he begs him for his daughter who's sick. He's, he's basically telling Jesus, my daughter is as good as dead if you don't hurry and come help. 
So in response to this plea, Jesus does. He agrees to go. See, where others have seen an, uh, an opponent, where others would have seen an opponent, Jesus sees an opportunity to extend mercy. Where others would, would look at it and say, oh, he's an opponent. Jesus sees an opportunity to extend mercy. Jesus sees Jairus and offers both mercy and dignity that needs uh, that the needs that he had were, were important and significant not only to him but to God as well. What would it look like for us as Christ followers to see other people and not see them as opponents, but to see them as opportunities for us to be God's instruments to extend mercy to them? Where are those people in your life who have different worldviews? come from different backgrounds, perhaps different religions that you are looking at and seeing through the lens of a filter, saying, oh, they're an opponent. They're on the wrong side. They're a foe. Rather than seeing them as an opportunity from God to be his instrument to extend mercy. That's what Jesus does here. And can you imagine that Jairus, as he hears that Jesus says, okay, I'll go. The immediately he gets up and goes, okay, let's go. We've got to go quick. And so they're off. In the midst of this journey, another character appears on the scene. Look at verse 25. And the woman was there who had been uh, subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all that she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. And when she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. And immediately her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him, and he turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you, his disciples answered. And yet you can ask, Who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. And the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet, and trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. See, the woman has this chronic disease. And she's had it for 12 years. And it's not just that she's sick, she's broke. She spent all that she had already in hopes that some other physician or doctor or medicine man could provide her with the healing that she was looking for to no avail. And so she hears of Jesus, and she comes up with this plan. It's mostly based on superstition. Hey, maybe if I just, like, touch his clothes, it would heal me. So she sneaks up. She touches his cloak. And immediately, she's healed. Verse 30, Jesus notices the power's gone out, and he stops. Now, I want you to think for a moment. He is on an urgent call with a girl who is on her deathbed. And yet he doesn't continue to rush to her. He stops. And he engages with this woman. And this woman represents the filter of interruptions or inconveniences. Interruptions or inconveniences. Do you ever use this filter? you ever see the cashier at the store checking you out slowly and think they're an inconvenience? you ever have a, a kid who runs into the room after you already sent them to bed? Say, oh, I, I just have one more question. And see them as an interruption to the way you wanted to spend your evening? You ever have that 10-minute block of time and think, oh, this is the way I want to use this. And then receive a phone call from someone and think, I probably should take this, but I really don't want to. Especially in a season like this, when we're all stressed by the holidays, isn't it easy to use this filter Priscilla Shira talks about interruptions, and she has this great quote. I love this. She says this, Believing that life interruptions are divine interruptions and a privilege not only causes us to handle them differently, but to await them eagerly. I love that phrase, to await them eagerly. Do we often look at interruptions that way? Do we await them eagerly? See, Jesus doesn't see this woman as an interruption or a distraction. He could have kept going, healing her, and just kept on going about his business. But he doesn't. He stops to look and find her in the crowd. He's eager to talk with her. 
I want you to think about this for a second. If he were an ER physician and he took the time to care for someone with a chronic disease and to talk with her while another patient was deathly ill, he would be sued, wouldn't he? We would see that as mal- malpractice. And yet Jesus doesn't operate in the same timeline that the rest of us do. He doesn't see people as interruptions or distractions, but treats them with the dignity that God has granted. Knowing the moment could be an opportunity to be God's instrument. Jesus serves as our model for so much of the way in which he calls us to live in this life. See, throughout the Gospels, what we see is that Jesus isn't operating on a daily planner. He isn't looking at his to-do list when he wakes up in the morning and thinking through, I need to heal these two people and have this teaching time and then spend some more time with the disciples because Peter's crazy. That's not what he's doing. He goes about his day and as life crisis and other people come to his feet, he takes the moment to engage with them, to extend respect and dignity and compassion to them. What would that look like in our lives? To no longer see people as distractions or interruptions to what we want to get done, but instead to see them as opportunities from God. See, where others see an interruption, Jesus sees an invitation to show dignity. Tony Evans uses this great illustration. Uh, Young people, you may not understand this, but... um, Back when I was a kid, uh, the only way to watch TV was to watch it live. There was no app or something that, my kids have no concept of that. It's like when they first saw a commercial. Um, And what would happen is as you were watching live TV, every once in a while, the emergency broadcast system would conduct a test. Do you remember this? And this screen would come up with these different colors and this annoying sound would come out and then you would hear this voice that says, this is a test. Ordinary programming was interrupted in order for a test to take place. Those distractions and inconveniences you and I experience are a test. God is using in our life when the ordinary programming of life gets interrupted so that he can do something for his purposes. What would it be like if you and I, this week, when that interruption happens, we hear that voice in our head that says, this is a test. And rather than being annoyed by it, rather than trying to avoid that individual, We instead leaned in in those moments and saw them as opportunities for us to engage with another person and to express dignity to them that they have before God the Father. That would look so radically different from what most people experience, wouldn't it? And yet that's the example that Jesus gives to us. Jesus shows us a more abundant way to live so that the next time your kid comes out after bedtime, And says, oh, well, I just had one more thing. Yes, they need to go to bed, but sometimes those are the very best conversations we have with our children. About deep things that they need to understand about God and our world. And we see those as an invitation rather than an interruption to the way that we want to spend our evening. During all of this, don't you know that Jairus is likely bouncing from one foot to the other? Thinking to himself, hurry up, come on, come on, come on. The way that I am when I get behind the person at, at the grocery store who has like 20 things, I'm just thinking, come on, hurry, 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 hurry. Jairus had to be thinking that. In verse 35, look what takes place. While Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told them, don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. And when they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. And he went in and said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. 
After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. And he took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. Jairus' daughter is another filter that we often use. And we often see people through this. And she represents the desperate or the defeated. Think about the way that we view certain people in our family. That nephew or cousin or uncle that's continued to stack bad decisions on top of each other. Maybe you interacted with them on Thursday. Maybe you'll see them at Christmas. But don't we often see other people and see them, oh, man, they're a lost cause. Think about that neighbor who continues to ostracize others on the block. The person who stops you coming out of the store and asks if they could have any money. Don't we often use this filter to see them, that they're beyond hope? That's Jairus' daughter, right? She had a chance, and now she's dead. We don't need to bug Jesus anymore with that. And once again, the filter of desperate or defeated, it could have been used, but Jesus shows us a different way. Jesus urges Jairus to trust him, to be patient. God's timing and ours are rarely on the same page. So he says, hey, just, just follow me. And so he takes Jairus, he takes Jairus' wife, he takes three of his disciples, and he, he gets all of the professional mourners who have showed up at the house to try to help the family grieve. He, he gets them all, and th- this was probably a physical altercation. He gets them out of the house, and they go into the room where the little girl was. And it wasn't that he chanted some mumbo-jumbo. He says, Talitha kum. It's an Aramaic phrase that means little one, honey, whatever kind of pet name that we would use. That's what Jesus uses here. It's the the wording that I use when my six-year-old won't get up on time to get to kindergarten. I go into his room. I sit next to him. Try to wake him up. That's what Jesus does here. Not only does he heal her, but he shows gentleness to her to say it's time to get up. It's time to awake. Where others see impossible, Jesus sees a window to restore hope. Who are the people in your life who are written off? We have a marriage ministry called Reengage. We have couples who will show up there. Not all couples are in desperation. A lot of couples just go through it just to work on their marriage. But some show up, and they're desperate. They're on the verge of divorce. And I am always amazed to watch as God does something, as those couples keep showing up, keep working, keep looking at themselves in the mirror and working on themselves. And the ways in which God has restored marriage after marriage after marriage. That if you would have asked them as they first showed up, hey, is there any chance? They would have said as strongly as they could, absolutely not. And yet, from God's perspective, there was possible. There was hope. Because God was able to restore what was broken. He was able to raise what was dead. He's still in the business of doing that today. Who are the people that others would look at and say, no, there is no chance. That God would look at and say, I'm going to bring that back to life. Perhaps as a person who's made poor decisions, after poor decision, after poor decision, and God would call you to be an instrument this week, to see them not as hopeless, not as beyond what God could do, but instead to look at them and be a window that restores hope. Jesus' life is littered with stories like this. So why is it that we are all so quick to see one another through these filters? What is it that causes us to run to that, to want to look at other people that way, rather than seeing them as image bearers the way that God does? Well, for some, we do it out of insecurity. It's easier for us to see others as enemies or the problem rather than seeing them as worthy of respect and honor. For others, it's because of comfort. It's way more comfortable for us to see others as a lost cause or hopeless, to see others as a distraction from our to-do list 
rather than seeing them as someone who's an image bearer worthy of compassion and mercy. But ultimately, any time we live in light of these filters, it's due to unbelief. It's because we are not believing and trusting all that God has said about us and others in Christ. Philip Yancey says this, grace is something we have to keep relearning. It's easy for us to get to a place in which we forget that we were God's enemies. We were interruptions. We were hopeless. But God. But God, in his great mercy, because of his love, came for his enemies. But God, in his love and his compassion, did not see us in all the needs that we brought and get annoyed by that. But instead he saw it as an invitation to share his mercy with us. But God, who saw us who were spiritually dead and lifeless and sent Jesus to rescue us so that we could experience life forever with him. That's the message of the gospel. That's the message of scripture. And for some this morning, perhaps that's a message that you've never heard. That you've always looked at scripture and thought, no, no, this is a deal in which I do more good than bad. And God will spare me. God will let me have heaven as, as a reward. And yet that's not what scripture tells us again and again and again. Scripture reminds us that we were enemies. We were interruptions. We were dead. And God loved us. And as a result of that love, he sent Jesus to this earth. That Jesus came and took the penalty for our sin on himself and rose again. And that the way to experience life forever with him is to come as Jairus did, desperate, with empty hands, nothing to offer God. There's nothing we could offer God. But instead coming desperate and saying, I am looking to you and you alone. That's the message of Scripture. That's the message that if you've never believed, I would beg you to believe in this moment. You can tell God that right where you sit, simply by saying, God, I have looked everywhere else, but in this moment I am trusting in Jesus alone. For many in this room, that's not a new message. But if you were honest, you'd say that is a message that I quite frequently forget. I forget that I was an enemy. I forget that, that in so many ways God could have seen me as an interruption. I, I forget that I was dead. And this is a reminder for us. And what should be true is that for people who are recipients of that type of grace, we should be the first ones who seek to extend that to others so that we would be God's instruments to be able to share his mercy and his compassion and his love with other people. Jesus invites us into a life with no filters, no filters, to be able to see other people with the same type of respect and dignity and mercy that he sees us with. And so that would be our challenge this week and throughout this season, this Christmas season, and in this cultural moment that we as Christ followers would forsake those filters that see other people in a way that doesn't hold to the image of God that they hold. Let us be faithful to do that. Let's pray. Father, we do come before you and we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness. We thank you for your word that is alive and true. Lord, that, that this was written for our encouragement, and for our hope. Lord, this morning, as we look at your word, I pray for every single one of us that your spirit would move in a way that would give us uh, clear steps to take in light of what we've seen of Jesus and his example. Lord, as we think about people in our lives that we see through a filter that causes us to treat them not with the respect, the dignity, the honor that they deserve as your image bearers. Lord, we confess that we often are guilty of that. And Lord, we ask that your spirit would give us power and discernment and wisdom 
and grace. To be able to see them as Jesus saw us. To be able to see them as individuals who need mercy and compassion. Lord, would you help us this week to be instruments that you use for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey, thanks for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, we would love to connect with you. Visit doxology.church slash connect or leave a comment below. And if you enjoyed today's message and you want to see more, make sure you give this video a like and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any new videos.